Bible is God's word. He inspired it for us. He speaks through it to us. I think science really should be the study of God's majesty, of his awesomeness. That's what we're doing with science. We're trying to find out more about God's creation. What this verse is saying is you look around and it has the stamp of an incredible creator, designer, artist all over it. We are lovingly made by a God who, who wants a relationship with us. That's why Christianity is so important to me, because it is everything. Without it, we have literally nothing. So I know, I know, deep down, however you've suppressed it, deep down, you have a sense that God is. You know that God is. Yes, I am. What's more reasonable to believe? That an eternal God made the world or that it made itself? That's what a banner does. It announces something with pride about somebody. Listen to this. His banner over you is love. Good morning. Nice to see you. Welcome to Bagan Community Church. If it's your first time, you're very, very welcome. We have tea and coffee afterwards. So, uh, yeah, please stay behind afterwards to get to know us. That would be really, really good. Hope you enjoy the service. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. There, there will be a, a bit of talking this morning before we get started. Ah, oh, I meant to bring my leaflets with me. Doesn't matter. All right. Um, tonight, we've got a communion service at 6 p.m in the multifunction room. Next week is men's breakfast, a uh, week earlier than usual because of Easter. Uh, John Parry's leading this morning. Pete's preaching. Pete's here with Jen. Pete was last with us in November. No, beginning of December. Preached on, you don't know, preached on Psalm 131. You don't know, do you? Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Pete, I, I don't need to introduce Pete, really. I've introduced him several times before. Uh, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, and a, you've been an amazing friend to me for a long time now, Pete. Um, introduced by Jonathan Thomas, I think, who's our mutual friend that started us off together. But yeah, Pete's been fantastic um, and comes from a church in Newport um, that we love dearly, a fantastic church, Christ Church. So Pete will be preaching from 1 Peter in a little while. Um, Mia, Mia had a little baby girl, so Mia and Jacob Congratulations to those uh, t uh, today. Uh, Alora was born six pounds, 13 and a half ounces. I'm looking for Nick and Natalie to confirm. Is that right? Have I got that right? Oh, there we are in the middle. Yeah, so many congratulations. And Alora is doing well now, right? Fantastic. That's really good. Craig. Craig and team are off to Romania in a sh short couple of months. So Craig has some stuff he wants to run by you. Yeah, good morning. Um, as you, most of you know, we go to Romania, or how I've been going for the last 10 years or so, and we're gonna go again this year. So we are looking for some support from you, obviously prayerful, uh, hopefully financial as well. Uh, it's, so there's six of us going from this church out to Romania in the end of June, to do a week-long residential club for children with life-limiting illnesses. We get to tell them the really good news that Jesus died for them, loves them, so we're going to be doing that. I, I'm not going alone, so we've got Katie Brown going with us to this year, Edie and Noah Williams, James Harris and Kira Parkins. So we've got four teenagers going, and the church has given us an amazing £1,500 towards our trip, we're looking to raise another 1,500 so that we can all go for relatively cheaply, especially the teenagers amongst us, not me. 
And uh, so we're going to be doing some fundraising. So today, we're going to tell you about a quiz night that we're going to have on Friday the 12th of April here. It's going to be a family quiz night. There will be food tasting as one of the rounds. Uh, there'll be cartoon rounds. So it will be very family friendly. So it'll be about 6.30 here on Friday the 12th. Tickets are adults, £5, children, £2, under 16s. And if you've got a family, that would be £12 for the whole family. It should be a good one, so we're hoping to raise some money from that. I did that at my granddaughter's church a few weeks ago, and they raised over £400, so that was amazing. This year it is going to be special, because it will be my last year going. I've realised I'm getting a little bit uh, long in the tooth now. So that will be important. I'm going for the last time, which will be uh, emotional, because I'll get to know the children really well. The second reason is great because I'm taking my eldest granddaughter with me. I know, I, I couldn't hear the gasps. Thank you. I am that old, yes. And the last one is that normally I just help run the, the one and a half hours God slot every day. But this year they've asked me to run the whole camp. So I'm in charge of the whole camp, which could be 100 people. So I am sweating a little bit on the inside. So quiz night on the... 15, uh, the 12th of April. After the service, we, some of us, the people that are going, are going to be at the back there giving you free Smarties. So they've got, they've got a wrapper on there. So what I would like you to do is obviously eat the Smarties because that will be a blessing to you. And then you can bless us by filling that up with money. Um, I've no, I found out you can put 20 Ps in there for easily. 50 Ps for easily. Pound coins even fit in these. And, you know, if you screw it up really carefully, 50 pound notes can fit in these as well. <laughs> so we'll be handing these out at the end. Um, and that's it. So please support us prayerfully. It is going to be a great trip of telling the gospel to these children who really, really need to hear it sooner rather than later. So thank you very much. Okay. Can you put the uh, image up on the screen, please, Pete? Uh, if you put the other one first, if that's okay. Uh, so, uh, for the last few weeks now, we've been going through the book of Acts, and the focus is um, actually taking the gospel out, right? And we began the series by saying that we prioritize the one over the 99. Jesus leaves the 99 to go and find the one, right? And so, that needs to be our focus. That needs to be our focus, reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as a church, what we've done is we've conceived a series of events uh, which will take place on Sundays. It'll be the last Sunday of every month, starting with Easter Sunday. And so here are some of the themes, if you, you head to the next um, screen. So how to find eternal life, that will be on Easter Sunday. How to find answers to gender identity questions. Uh, that's a hot topic today, isn't it? Um, uh, I'm pretty convinced that, or confident rather, that I can approach that in a, a compassionate, um, sensitive, truth-based, evangelistic way. Um, and so I think that would be a great uh, one, particularly to encourage people to come in. But going down the list, I just thought they were titles that maybe would appeal to people who are not saved, um, maybe get them thinking, uh, but also provide opportunity for you guys to invite people to come along. Um, so there are the series of events. We have leaflets. They're not meant to go out on the doors, but you may want to take one or two, keep them on you, and when you're chatting to somebody and you think, ah, I could actually invite those to a special service, then use that leaflet for that purpose. They're on the back table as you leave. After every event as well, we will put on food, so there will be free food as an extra incentive for you to invite people to. For the Easter Sunday one, it's two weeks' time, which is super, super close now, right? Um, so on Easter Sunday, it's going to be evangelistic with a testimony, with a children's talk. Um, during the service, the kids will have worksheets to work through. After the service, there'll be um, a, an Easter egg hunt for the kids, and we'll be putting on hot cross buns. So it won't be a meal on Easter Sunday, but it will be hot cross buns. So start thinking, guys, about who you might invite. Now, we've also done some uh, bookmarks. So on the way out, you please take a bookmark. And the bookmark has the kind of the catchphrase, who's your one? 
So what we want to encourage you to do is to think about just one person, not 10 or 20. Don't think in terms of kind of, I think we sentimentalize sometimes evangelism, don't we? And we, we think, oh, I need to see like 20 of my closest colleagues and, and relatives saved this year. And it's just unrealistic. It's far more realistic and effective if you think about just one person. Uh, one person that you will show love to, one person that you will speak to, one person that you will pray for, one person that you will seek to invite to church and focus on that one. So um, over the coming weeks, I'm going to be kind of sending out some stuff on Facebook and email eventually, um, which will help you to understand who to choose as your one, how to show love to that one, and then also how to speak to that one as well. Uh, so take a, um, uh, what, did, what did I call them, bookmark? Take a bookmark when you leave. At some point, write the name of that one and then start praying for them. Start thinking about how you can show love to them and invite them to church. But we start Easter Sunday. Cool. I think that's it before we get going. Shall we pray? Let's pray together. Father, uh, thank you so much that there are so many of us here who uh, Jesus sought when we were lost and saved us. Thank you so much that there would have probably been many people in our lives who were praying for us, people who invited us to church, people who spoke to us, people who showed love to us in so many ways. And as a result of that, and by your grace, we were saved. Lord God, will you lay on our hearts a desire to see the lost saved? And will you particularly lay on our hearts one individual that we can seek to love for the kingdom? And for this service now, God, we ask you, will you send your spirit? Will you move through your word? Will you help us to lose inhibitions? And will you enable us to worship you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Neil. Should we stand together? How sweet the sound to save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power?
the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace. I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. says this in, in 1 John. It says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Oh, God, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for your incredible love that you have lavished on us. God, I pray this morning that you will speak powerfully through your word, God. That you will reignite the fire that has been dimmed for whatever reason in many of our lives God but today God you will set us back on your on the right path today God you will set our hearts on fire for you God forgive us God that we can come into a service like this with our faith levels down to the floor and even lower God but we remember once again God that you are a God who saves you're the God who's in control the God of the universe the creator God the all-powerful God who loves us who made a way for us god we just praise you god that we can proclaim these next two incredible hymns god knowing that these words are so so true god that we stand here before your throne that we have a strong and we have a perfect plea god we thank you the throne of God above I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written can bid me dance deep when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within of what I look and see
my Savior and my God. God, we thank you for your incredible love, your amazing grace. We ask you speak powerfully through Pete now as he shares your word with us. In your great name, amen. Good morning. Great to be back here with you again. Um, I bring you the greetings from all at Christ Church in Newport. Uh, and we've got a, our intern, got a German intern with us for a little while. He's speaking for the first time this morning. So I think he's relieved that I'm not there. Um, it really is a pleasure to be with you and appreciate Neil's words. He's been a delightful friend for me as well. And so it's great to be back in Baglan and to, to worship with you and to share the word with you. If you have a Bible, 
Would you please turn to the book of 1 Peter, the letter of 1 Peter? And we're going <clears> to <throat> jump into a middle bit here in chapter 1. And uh, the title, if you want a title for this morning, is Hope for Those in Exile. Hope for Those in Exile. Now, whether you think you're in exile or not, I hope to show you you are in exile, but there is hope. So I'm going to read this, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into it. So I'm reading chapter 1, verse 22, through to chapter 2, verse 3. Here we go. And I'm reading from the ESV, the essentially sound version. (laughs) Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to this text, I thank you that you love to speak and re-speak your word when your church gathers. Lord, in my weakness, I pray you would give me grace and help me. And for us all, that we would not just be informed in our minds, but that our, our hearts would be affected, our faith would be engaged, and that we would encounter you and your wonderful Lord Jesus, as we go into this text. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday I celebrated a birthday. um, That the birthday, I won't tell you how old I am, but the Beatles considered that the age I was yesterday is the age that everybody gets old, sitting by the fire, knitting, Um, going out in the garden, would that we could go out in the garden and do some weeding. Yes, I am 64 years old. And uh, as a 64-year-old, I I feel like I'm I'm an exile in everything. I, I just don't understand the world in which I live most of the time. It seems to me that a bit like Alice went through the the looking glass or went down into the rabbit hole, I've ended up in a world that is so completely different to the world in which I grew up. Um, Or it's like being in Oz. If I could click my heels together and say there's no place like home, part of me thinks, where am I? I search on the news, I search on the TV, I see things going on, I think, I can't help for What? I don't know if you feel that way at all. Um, If you don't, well... You should. There's a, you're Welsh, so you, you know the word hiraith. Um, if there's, a, there's a word, I'm, I'm an Englishman, but I've lived in Wales most of my life. There's a, there's a German word for the same word, sehnsucht. And it's, you know, you can't really, there's no English word for hiraith. There's just no English word. People say homesickness, but hiraith is more than homesickness. It's, it, particularly hiraith is linked into Wales, but sehnsucht into Germany. But it's more than that. Here I think, if you want to define it, it's a longing for a place or a people, a pastime, with a degree of grief and loss. That's what it is. Uh, I remember going back home to my my hometown of Coventry in the Midlands uh, with my sister a number of years ago. And while we were there, we were scattering at my parents' ashes. And while we were there, I said, come on, let's go and see granddad's house. We haven't been there for, I don't know, decades and decades and decades, and they'd gone many years before. And we drove down the road of where he used to live and got out the car and looked at the house, and I was overwhelmed with emotion. Just suddenly I remembered so much. Happy times, remembered the joy, remembered 
the, everything looked the same, but everything had changed. They were gone, my parents were gone. And there was in me this sense of longing for a time past, longing for a place past where I was secure, where I felt I fit. And I would have to say, half the time, in the world in which I am, in the world in which I live, I don't necessarily feel secure in that. I don't fit in that. Now, look who Peter's writing to in the beginning of this letter. He says, Peter, <clears throat> excuse me, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So he's writing to people that have been scattered into Turkey. I was in Turkey a few weeks ago with a church in Istanbul, and this is the people to whom he's writing. He's writing to people that have ended up in these Roman provinces, and he wants to encourage them because they are exiles. They don't fit in the world in which they find themselves. They're literal exiles. We see this from Acts chapter 8, how they're thrown out of Jerusalem and other places. They're literal exiles. They've lost so much. They've lost their home. They've lost their culture, their familiarity, their influence, their standing. They really are refugees displaced in an unfamiliar and hostile world. A bit like, if you read Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when they said, sing us songs from the, the Lord's songs, sing us the songs of Zion. How can we do that in a strange land? As he's speaking into the people who are exiles in Babylon. But these people are exiles too. And not only are they literal exiles, some of them are just, they may have always been there, but they're metaphorical exiles. They may have said, well, we've always lived in Bithynia or Cappadocia or Asia, and yet we don't fit anymore in this Roman provincial world. Um, who they are, how they now live as Christians, they no longer fit in a world that they probably used to. I love reading about uh, Roman history, as lots of guys do. Tom Holland is the best one. His books on Roman history are wonderful. And you realize just how different the Christian world is for the world in which they were living. How different the call upon Christians, how different the priorities of Christians, how different what they believed and how they lived. These people here understand Hirath. They're longing for another time, another place, another world. A bit like we had, we had uh, a Ukrainian family, a mum and two daughters, live with us for six months uh, last year. And they understand Hirath. They understand this longing to be back in Ukraine. They can't because they're just by, from by Mariupol. Uh, they can never get back there. They, it looks like they're here permanently in this country. But they long to be home. They long to be in the familiar. They long to be where they know they fit and feel secure. And in some way, now more than ever, I would say, we can feel the same, even though we've never moved, so, because so much around us has moved, particularly, I would say, over the last five to ten years. So much has changed. We are living in a world that can be a struggle to understand, a world that can become foreign to us, in which we don't fit. Um, and that can cause us to lose our stability, our bearings, our understanding, and maybe even our sanity. You know, we've had years of lockdown, which was weird, to now European war, the, the world has never been more precarious, to now the Middle East conflict, with all that's going on with that, demonstrations on the streets of London every Saturday, on top of that, there are so many other things taking place. What are they teaching my grandchildren in the schools at the moment? Why has they shut down the boys' and girls' toilets and just had one for both in that school? What is going on here? I saw, as, as Neil was talking to you about, talking about transgenderism and the issues that relate around that, which almost seems like, because it is, a new religion because it's talking about the gendered soul. Well, that is a faith-based thing that is now permeated the world in which we live, whether it's the, the media 
or companies or government, this sense of we must comply, we must fit in, we must move with this, people possibly having their bank accounts shut down, church is probably in a place over the next few years where if they don't comply with certain things that are believed to be true by this new religion, that we'll have our monies taken from. Well, I'm afraid we're not prepared to allow you to have covenant returns, for instance. We're in a strange new world. And these people were in the same. The religion of self and subjectivity that permeates everything, the gendered soul. And I think, Lord, I'm 64 years old now. What am I doing here? I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I think, I, has the world gone mad? Or have I just missed up? Or let me go back. You know, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. But here's the thing that I see in this. Just like the people Peter is writing to, God has placed me and you here in this place at this time in history, according, it says here, look at this, the elect exiles, they're called, they're exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God. When I say to the Lord, my friend, Lord, I think I'm a man born out of time. The Lord goes, I didn't birth you out of time. I know what I'm doing. You are the right person at the right time in the right place. I want you here now. Your life, your birth, what you're going through has purpose at this time in this place. Now that gives me comfort. Rather than just sitting at home, shutting the door, going, you know, let's, oh Lord, come Lord Jesus, I'm ready to go. No, there is purpose and there is meaning, and that's encouraging here. So in this strange new world, and it is, in the midst of this, what do they have, what do we have, that will help us, that is absolute, while things are changing around us all the time, true, real, unchanging, reliable, solid. What do we have? And that's what Peter wants them to know in these few verses. He wants to, them to know what is incorruptible, what can't be corrupted, what won't fall apart, what will stand and will strong. So I've got four things I'm going to do in the second bit. And the four things he talks about are so simple, yet so profound. As we look at the world in which we live, and we look at what's going on, and where are we at, and how do we function, the four things are simple. It's our salvation, it's his word and promises, it's our family, the church, and it's his presence. Let me open those up for you and show you these from this text. Firstly, our salvation. Look at verse 22 here of chapter 1. Having purified your souls, he says, by your obedience to the truth. What does that mean, having purified your souls? We wouldn't think that we've got pure souls. But he's saying this is something that's already taken place. Through your obedience or your trust or your faith in the truth, which is the gospel, your souls have been purified. So I might be living in a world that is, I think this is impure, this is nuts, this is crazy, I don't fit. But Peter says, but, but guys, exiles, everybody, but something has happened internally where there is a purity and it's in your souls. And it's come about through faith in Christ, through obedience to the truth. Whatever else happens for those in Christ... Peter wants them to know your souls are secure in him. Now, their bodies may not be, particularly in all this area of Turkey, because there was great, great persecution going to take place. Within a few years, Nero is Caesar at this point. And you know what happened under his Caesar, under his reign. 
But he's saying, whatever else happens for you, you are secure. You have, he said in verse 23, been born again, not of perishable seed. You see how he wants to contrast the world to them. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed. What you have internally, when everything else may be looking like it's falling apart, that is perishing, you have something within you that can never perish. A soul rescued through the grace of God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as he spills his blood on the cross and dies for you and calls you and you respond to the gospel, your soul is purified by the truth. It will never change. It will always be the case, and it can't perish. Here's what won't perish, is what he's saying. And this is a theme for Peter. If you, we went through the whole of 1 Peter earlier this year. It's a magnificent letter, particularly for now. It's the theme. If you look at verse 4, verse 7, verse 18, verse 23, he's always talking about what's perishable, and what's not perishable, what's, what will fall apart and what won't fall apart. And so if you read through these few chapters, you go, there it is again, there it is again, there it is again. We have a living hope, he says, through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So as Luther said, the body they may kill, this truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. So when I look around and I think, Am I in the looking glass? The Lord goes, hey, internally, your soul is held, changed, purified, and that will never, ever perish. We are permanently and always in him. So it, when he cries out, it is finished on the cross. His work is finished, but he has finished that sense of our souls are now in him and his. We are saved. When nothing else is secure, this is secure. Christ died for my sins. This is secure. My soul is safe. It is well with my soul. For he keeps it and holds it. So firstly, our salvation. Then he wants to show them more. His word and promises. Look at this in verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed. He's comparing now physical birth and spiritual birth. Not of perishable seed, physical birth, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Do you see what he's doing? He's comparing and contrasting what's perishable, what's imperishable. He's comparing and contrasting the physical nature. When he says flesh, it's not just <clears throat> physical things, but it's the whole world system. It's everything that's not of God. And he says, you've got the perishable and the imperishable. The imperishable comes through the word of God. The perishable through everything else. There are two contrasting things here. Everything else is, transit is, is, is in transition. Everything else is temporary. Nothing is going to last. Whether it's, whether it's ideas or philosophies or thoughts or premises or religions or new kind of teaching and all the stuff I freak out about and think, is this the way it's going to be now? And he goes, this all will fall apart. And only one thing will last. The world will pass away. But my word will never pass away. So he says, I know it's a bit weird out there, guys. I know you're exiles, but think about this. Firstly, you are saved and your soul is secure. Secondly, what saved you was this, the word of God. It is imperishable, enduring. It will not change. Everything else will change. Everything else will fit in. I don't know if you read Edward Gibbon, the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. 
When this was written, no one considered that the Roman Empire might disintegrate. But it did, as did the Berlin Wall, as did every ideology and every thought and every process that sets itself up against the Word of God. But the Word of our Lord stands forever. So when I read this word and the promises of God, I know that they're true and I know that they're right. He quotes here from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40 is a, a, a fascinating, we, a lot of us know it. It starts with, comfort, oh comfort my people, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, tell her a warfare has ended. And then he goes in to quote this. But to understand Isaiah 40, you've got to understand Isaiah 39. Don't have time to go there. Oh, I wish I did. Isaiah 39, okay. The king's Hezekiah, Judah's king, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, Hezekiah is a half-wit. Uh, what Hezekiah does is he brings in the Babylonian king, and he shows him all his gold. He brings it, he says, check this out, mate. And he opens the doors, and he shows him everything. And then he goes and boasts to Isaiah, hey, you wouldn't believe it. This guy was so impressed with what's going on. And Isaiah says, you, you moron. Or words to that effect. What, what, what have you done? He goes, oh, he was really impressed. I said, you bet. And Isaiah says, you know what's going to happen? He's going to come back with his armies. He's going to carry you all off. And it's all going to be a complete nightmare. And he's going to take it all. And everybody's going to go into exile. All the, best, all the people are going to be pulled into Babylon. And Hezekiah says, like, when's this going to happen? He says, for, your, for the next generation when your son's king. So Hezekiah just goes... Oh, well, at least it's not me. That's how, that's, how, that's how Isaiah 39 finishes. Isaiah 40, Isaiah then thinks and prophesies to these people he's just warned about who are, now, who are going to be in Babylon in the years to come. So Isaiah 40 is the response of Isaiah in grief of what's going to take place to speak. And in that, we get this text. He's telling the people in Babylon, the exiles, look, flesh is grass, its glory is the flower of the fields, the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls, but exiles, listen to this, the word of the Lord remains forever. The promises of God that we read, all that God says, it's ours, it's real, it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it will come about when God says, the glory of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That is an absolute that will never be undone. Everything else will fall apart. So my soul is secure. His word is secure. Thirdly, our family. Exiles, you've got your salvation. You've got his word. But you've got each other. Look at this. In verse 22, and then again, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since, since you are part of a spiritual brotherhood and not just a physical one. And then he goes on in chapter 2, verse 1, so put away all malice, Deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, like babies long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow. He's saying here, this you do have. That's all that Peter's trying to do. Get them to see what they do have, not what they don't have. This is the church locally, throughout history, throughout geography. The church is birthed through Christ. There is something when he's on the cross that John emphasizes hugely when the spear goes into our Lord, and there's this copious flow of blood and water. People say, well, is that about, you know, the heart shows that the heart has gone. Now, where do you get a copious flow of blood and water? You get it at birth. It's the birthing of the church. It's the birthing of his people. I think partly it means that. And he's saying, you've been birthed of an imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God, which is the gospel that you have heard of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Lord. He says, have a sincere Philadelphia with one another, affectionate 
brotherly love, love of family, love earnestly from a pure heart. You have a pure heart, now love earnestly from it. Okay. The point is this. You may not fit in this world. You may not fit anywhere, but in Christ, we have others of the same family. We fit here. As weird as we may be, as strange as we may be, as diverse as we may be, what do I have? You have your salvation. Your soul is purified. You have his word. It will never fail. And you have each other. You have a familial relationship which is intense and real and imperishable, born of through Christ. In this case, water baptism, I think he's saying. That's what he talks about, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for love, love one another from the house, because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the word of God. And this sense of through the initiation of baptism into the church, which he talks about at other points, into a family is this this sense of joining that is indissoluble. My, my, dad, my dad used to say, which I know a lot of us would say, blood is thicker than water. My dad had a very high, I was a bit like the mafia, really. I grew up in that. This is the way you treat your family. This is, this is priority. Whatever else happens, you know, family first. What Peter's saying is there is a family that is first above and beyond anything. That is the family of God. You have these people here in, in Bithynia and Asia and Cappadocia and all around there, Galatia. These people, the minute they became Christians, would have been completely non-persona. Non They'd have been removed. They'd have been lost everything. And Peter says, but you do have each other. As I said, I was in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago with a, a dear friend there I've known for 20 years who's pastoring a church in Istanbul. Um, he's, a, he's a Turk. And yet, for the people that get saved in Istanbul, uh, that's it. When they confess Christ and stand away from their, their Muslim background, they are hounded, they are sought after, they are, they are at, the, at best ignored, and yet they have each other. And yet, here we are, a people born again through Christ, and we have family. So he put away, he says, all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, notes all of it. Why? Because these are community-destroying vices, and this is what the world is like, but not so in the church. In the church, he says, put it away. Do not be like that. Enjoy the grace that you have with one another. I know we're a strange lot. I know the scripture says in many ways we all offend. You better believe it. That's normal church life. And the temptation to malice and deceit and envy. See, the difference between envy and, say, jealousy. Jealousy is when I want what you have. Envy is when I don't even want you to have what you have. Put it all away, he said, so you can rejoice with one another because you have one another. You know, I talk to a lot of pastors. And, uh, and the truth is, I've, I've never seen churches destroyed from outside, from without. Churches are robust. We have the salvation of God. We have the word of God. Churches, if they're going to be destroyed, are destroyed from the inside, where these things are allowed to dwell where a root of bitterness may spring up and defile many. In this crazy world in which we live right now, my dear friends, ensure that together, as the people of God, we live in such a way that not only reflects something different to the world, but enables us to be secure, where grace, 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 is not just what we preach about, but it is the taste of who we are together. People walk in and they go, I taste this. I'm safe here. 
I know I'm broken, but I'm a broken person in the midst of broken people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. Finally, his presence. Chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, we see here. He says this, like newborn infants. That's what you, you see what he's done, in fact. He's talked about conception, the seed. He's then gone to babies, and then he's going to talk about growing up. So he's, he, that's how Peter's thinking. Like newborn uh, infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. What does this mean? I think this clearly means, because he's gone from conception to birth to growth. What is the pure spiritual milk? Well, he explains what it is. It's tasting that the Lord is good. So he says, you've got your salvation. You've got my word, his word. You've got one another, and you have the Holy Spirit. That's what, that's what he's talking about. The tasting, the imbibing, the sense of presence, the sense of not just believing this in my head, but being aware he is with me, he is in me. When I was born again of the Spirit of God, that Spirit of God came and dwelt within me as with everybody else who is a Christian. And he says, grow in him. Grow in that sense of experience of him, of taste of him, tasting that the Lord is good. And a taste is not enough. We've tasted, so he's saying, like a newborn who's tasted the milk, ah, go after it. Lord, I want more of you. I need, I need to know you're here. We sang a hymn years ago, and we've, it's been changed now, hasn't it? I need thee every hour. You know that hymn? Most precious Lord. Yeah, and I need thee. Oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. And the joy is, I know you do, and I am here. I am here. In all things we long for. He says, long for him, his closeness, his presence, his goodness. He promises he will never leave us alone as orphans, but will come to us in his person of the Holy Spirit. He promises he'll never fail us, nor forsake us, nor leave us. There is that sense of intimacy with him that's sometimes difficult to grasp or understand, but he is here. So in all these things, my friends, as you switch on the TV, you listen to the radio, or you go online, and you see what's coming, and you see what's happening. You wonder, where am I, and what's the future going to look like? And uh, I should be attending the garden, doing the weeds. I should be sitting by the fireside knitting. That was your bit, I think, rather than me, baby, because you knit, and I can't. You know, when I'm 64, I didn't think I'd be going, I think the world's gone mad. I... I uh, what, what, what's happening now? I thought we were secure from all this, but we're not secure, and the world seems to be less secure than ever, and what's the future going to hold? And we've just had two years of lockdown, and I, this is not what I expected. The Lord comes to us through 1 Peter and says, I, I, I know you feel out of place, but let me tell you, this is you have that will never fail, that will never fall, that will never change. You have your salvation. You have your salvation. Your, your soul has been purified through obedience to the word of God, the gospel. You have my word and promises. And even if everything else falls apart, because ultimately it will, my word will never fall apart. You can trust it implicitly. You have each other. Don't, don't miss the, the joy of... And the privilege it is to be part of a family of imperishable seed born through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So look after that. And you have me. You have me. You have tasted that I am good. I am still here. You can experience the reality of who I am.
so it's easy to long for a different day, a different time, a different place, a different situation. Um, but the call is to take that longing into the only one who is truly good, who can really satisfy the longing of the heart. And you know what? Be at peace. Be at peace. It's okay. You are exiled, but you're elect. Because he called you by the foreknowledge of God. We are in the right place at the right time. And these things have never changed. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I do pray that... Well, for anybody particularly this morning that maybe has come in here worried. Worried about their life, worried about the situation, worried about the world, worried about the kids, worried about their grandkids, worried about their friends, worried about their job, worried just, Lord, may these, these four truths that Peter tells the exiles, these glorious truths that will never change, that are imperishable, let them hold all of us, but for any in particular in that place, May these truths change our hearts and minds and bring peace. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we're in you. We thank you that you have saved us once and for all, and our soul is secure and safe. We thank you that your word will never fall. It will never fail. It will stand, and when all else is gone, your word will still be true and real. Lord, I thank you for the church. I thank you for this church for your grace to this church, for what you have built here. May they strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and so find a security and a grace that can only be found in a local church. And Lord, may we all experience more of your Spirit in ways in the past we may have tasted of you and seen that you are good. May we taste more of you, Lord, we say again with the hymn writer, we need thee every hour. And thank you, Lord, you are there in the person of the Holy Spirit to be close to us, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. So come alongside us and thank you for these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Over to you guys. stand together.
sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus Christ finished by reading the first part of 1 Peter. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Oh God, we just thank you for your incredible word. We thank you for that brilliant reminder of how safe we are in your hands, God, that you hold us secure, God. Help us to dive deeper into you, God, to know more of you in our lives. God, we pray that, God. We don't want to be lost in any other words this morning, but help us to know more of you, more of your presence. God, help us to pick up your word daily, speak to you daily, walk with you talk with you experience more and more of you as individuals and as your church collectively God we want to glorify and lift up your name and your precious name Amen please take your seats guys